Well, today we are, are continuing the series that we've been in now since uh, September, and uh, it's a series called Sent Life on Mission. And for those of you who are brand new, I always take just a minute or two at the top just to kind of, kind of focus this in, what this series is about, bring up to speed. Uh, this is a series based on one of the longest books uh, in the second part of our Bible we call the New Testament. It's a, a series based on a book called Acts. And so uh, the author of Acts is a man named Luke. He's a follower of Jesus. He's well-educated. He's a doctor. He's really, um, he's really kind of taken, fascinated with the whole movement of Jesus. And so he writes a two-volume account based on careful historical research, first on the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, and then secondly, on the birth of his movement and the rapid growth of the next 30 years as it spreads from Jerusalem across the Roman Empire all the way to Rome. And so volume one, we call the Gospel of Luke. Volume two, we call the, the book of Acts. And they're designed to be read together like uh, uh, volume one and a sequel uh, to that. And so uh, for the last uh, several weeks, we've been looking at an event that happens very early in the life of this movement. We're just a couple months into this movement of Jesus in Jerusalem. And uh, if you've been here, you know that the, the scene is that uh, the scene takes place at the temple. It's a huge complex, 35-acre walled fortress. Uh, two of the leaders of this young movement of Jesus are heading in at three o'clock, the hour of prayer to pray one day. And they see this man, they've probably seen him many times before, who's uh, been lame since birth. He's in his 40s. And uh, Peter feels called by God to heal him. And so in the name of Jesus, he heals him. And of course, this draws a huge crowd, probably hundreds and thousands of people, because it's in this huge complex with our prayer. And they come together, and he shares the message of Jesus. And it was by the power of Jesus, his name, that he healed this man. He talks about his life, his death, his resurrection, what it means for them, why he's the Messiah of Israel. And there's a huge response. Prior to that time, we were told that there was 3,000 men who had come into the movement of Jesus right away. It now rises to 5,000 men. You had the, the women and children. We're probably up to 10, 15,000 people. And every day they're meeting at the temple courts on the east side of the temple complex, huge area called Solomon's Colonnade. They're meeting every day there for prayer, teaching, worship, and so on. Uh, and, so, um, and so it's a big event, right? The problem is, is that this event happens on temple property. And uh, the temple authorities, uh, the leaders of Israel, uh, most of them were anti-resurrection. Not just the resurrection of Jesus, but they didn't believe in the doctrine of resurrection. We'll talk about more later. And so now they've got these young upstarts, this huge movement on their property, so to speak, uh, teaching what they would consider as false doctrine. So they're going to arrest these guys. They put them in jail overnight. Next day, they bring them in front of their large, uh, kind of their, the high court of Israel. It's called the Sanhedrin. It's made up of 70 men. Uh, led by the high priest, and they're interrogated, and they ask him, how did you do this miracle? It's amazing, but how did you do it? Now, they can't deny the miracle because everyone knows this guy. He's there every day at 3 o'clock. In fact, they've actually brought the man into the courtroom as part of a material witness. So they can't deny it, um, but they want to stop it. And so they, they say, you know, uh, how did you do it? And so Peter just kind of goes off. He says, well, if you want to know, you know how I healed this, this lame man, uh, it's really Jesus, you know, the same guy you killed a couple months ago. Remember him? Uh, he's kind of back. And, uh, and so you murdered the Messiah, by the way. You're sort of in big trouble. Um, and if you want to know, that's how we did it. And so he's just very bold. He's very, you know, very bold, very courageous. And so that's where we're picking up the story. It's like, what happens next? And so if you have your Bibles or apps, let's go ahead and open up and turn them on to uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. And so uh, in 4.13, it says, when they see the courage of Peter and John, I mean, they're just so bold, they realize that they're unschooled and ordinary men. In other words, they hadn't been to rabbinic training. And uh, so they're really astonished. They're just kind of blown away by this. Uh, they're not used to this kind of boldness in this high court. I mean, it's like the Supreme Court, and they're just kind of really standing up for, for what they believe. And all of a sudden, they take note that these men have been with Jesus. It's like, oh, no, we thought we got rid of him, right? So they thought they got rid of Jesus, and now there's these people acting just like Jesus. Um, they're not educated in the rabbinic tradition like Jesus wasn't, and yet they're speaking with amazing authority, wisdom, grace, power, conviction, uh, like Jesus, and they're healing people like Jesus. Like, oh, no, we got more Jesus people you know, around. And so they're like, oh, oh, here we go again. So... Uh, but since they, couldn't, they, 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 could, uh, they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there's really nothing they could say. And so they order them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin. They take Peter and John out, and they confer together, like, what are we going to do? This is a mess. And so they say, what are we going to do? Interesting, by the way, obviously, Luke, in doing his historical research, 
he has an insider report on this thing. And so many people have theorized it may have been the Apostle Paul, who at this time was Saul and very opposed to the movement of Jesus. We don't know for sure. But um, they said, what are, we gonna, what are we gonna do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign. We can't deny it. I mean, social media is blowing up, right? It's on YouTube. Someone's got video of this thing. Uh, Snapchat's going off. I mean, it's just like crazy. Someone's there, Periscope. And uh, they said, but to stop this thing from spreading any further, and catch this. Yeah, I want you to catch this. You, you, would you think about this time? These are the same leaders that about two or three months before had arrested Jesus, executed Jesus, and put Roman guards at his tomb uh, and when Jesus came out of the grave and the stone rolled away, the guards came back and told them what happened. They paid off the guards to say that someone stole the body. And now this healing's taking place in the name of Jesus. Do you think at some point you might say, hey, maybe we've got this wrong? But see, they're not really interested in getting it right. They're interested in holding on to their power, their position, their authority, the status quo. They've got something to protect. protect. And this is what I want to catch. Uh, we're going to talk about this later. Is that when people persecute Christians, the reason given for why they persecute is often not the real reason. There is something they are protecting that's of deeper value than the truth. right? And so they send... Um, Everyone in Jerusalem knows that they performed a notable sign. We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading, that's their major concern, uh, we must warn them not to speak any longer in this name. So they say, okay, that's the best we can do. So they call them in again. They command them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And so Peter and John said, okay, well, let me ask you a question, just wondering. Um, I, I get what you're saying. But do you think it's like right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? Amen. Like you're the top court in the land. Um, you're the leaders of our nation, so I just got a question. Would you say, in general, that we should listen to you or to God? Like, what would you think? Because you're like the judge. You're like the smart people, right? So, obviously, if God has raised Jesus from the dead, God's put his signature on Jesus. Obviously, if he's healing this man in the name of Jesus, God's putting his signature on Jesus. So God seems to be standing with Jesus, you're not. What would you say would be where we should stand? Right? Now, it's sort of a rhetorical question, um, but notice he's kind of respectful. He doesn't just go off on him. He just kind of asks that question. And, um, and then he comes back and he says, uh, as for us, we, we can't stop speaking about what we've seen or heard. I mean, we've seen Jesus. You killed him. We saw him. We've had dinner with him. We spent a month and a half with him. He's alive, he's very real, he's got a new body. It's a really cool body, by the way, kind of 2.0. It can do amazing things. Uh, and so we, we know the future is real. We know he's the Messiah. We know there's salvation in no one else. We know he's the key to the universe. Um, so based on what we've seen in her, we really can't stop. And so we respectfully decline. Um, and so uh, after further threats, verse 21, they let him go. Uh, they couldn't really decide how to punish them because... All the people were praising God. They're between a rock and a hard place. They're like politicians that want to do something, but they can't because just popular demand is, is too great. And it's because a man who is miraculously healed, he's over 40 years old. And this is a crazy, crazy miracle, right? So, so that's the passage. Now, uh, next week, we're going to talk about what happens next um, because this is a major crisis for the early church. Um, they, up to this point, everything's been going really well. Movement's growing, expanding. Uh, people are coming to Christ. Everyone loves them. It's a very popular movement up to this point. It's all going to change at this point. And now the religious authority is going to turn against them. It's going to be the first kind of movement of persecution that's going to grow from this point on. And remember, where do they meet for church? They meet every day in the temple. Uh, where else are you going to put 10,000 people? They don't have a building, right? So now you got the leaders uh, of the nation against them. The same leaders that killed Jesus are now against them. The place where they meet is, is going to be watched. Uh, they've been warned not to do this anymore. They, they've got a major crisis. So next week, we're going to talk about what to do in a crisis. But uh, today, I want to focus on this whole theme of persecution. And uh, what we're going to see today is that if we're serious about following Jesus, 
If we're serious about uh, living life on mission, which is the topic of this whole series, then we, we have to be willing to go with Jesus. We have to be willing to pay a price for that, right? So we want to talk about that. What does it look like to follow Jesus? And I think this message is going to be particularly appropriate for this time in our culture. You know, when I, when I, first, uh, when I felt like God first put Acts on my heart to do, um, there's this series on Acts. Um, I really felt it was his idea, it wasn't mine. But when it came, I got excited for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is, is that I am convinced, unless there's a major spiritual revival in, our, in our, our country, that you and I are in for a rough road in the coming days. That the freedoms that we've known as a nation, the freedoms that we've known as followers of Jesus are going to be challenged. Uh, the price tag of following Jesus is going to go up in the next five years. And one of the things I felt like when God was putting in his heart is that my job is to get us ready as a church for the persecution that's coming. Right? So I don't want to overblow that, but I think it's very real. I think in the coming years, some of you are going to lose your jobs because of your faith. I think in the coming years, some of you aren't going to get jobs or promotions because of your faith. We're going to come under increasing scrutiny. There's going to be increasing criticism. There's going to be increasing um, kind, of, uh, 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 kind of attacks that are not based in reality, unfair judgments that are going to come. Right? And so, I, I just believe it's going to happen. And so as a church of Jesus, we need to be prepared for that. And we're not really used to that in our country. And so we need to get ready for that. And so today I want to talk about that. What does it look like to follow Jesus, live life on mission in a culture that's increasingly antagonistic to the message of Jesus? All right, so there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called Set the Cost. And I want to start with three basic principles uh, and then come back and ask one very pointed question at the end. Number one, the first thing that uh, they highlight for us today's passage is that persecution is part of the package. Like if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to life on mission, that we have to face the fact that, that persecution is part of the package. And we're going to see this all the way in, through Acts. It's just starting here. But we're going to see it all the way through. What we're going to watch in the next few chapters is that this persecution that's starting here is going to rise to a fever pitch until it gets so bad in Jerusalem, we're not sure exactly the timetable, in the next year or two, it's going to get so, uh, so intense that almost all the Christians are going to be forced to flee from Jerusalem. They're going to become like Syrian refugees. They're going to have to run for their lives and leave Jerusalem. And what we're going to see as we go through the book of Acts is that as the message of Jesus spreads out across the Roman Empire, wherever it goes, it will lead to persecution. Uh, and the kind of persecution or the reasons for the persecution will vary based on the audience, whether it's Jewish or Gentile, but, but there'll always be persecution as part of the story. And here's what I want you to catch. The reason that there will always be persecution for followers of Jesus is at its core, the message of Jesus is countercultural. The message of Jesus always will challenge some of the most deeply held and prevailing values of every culture. Now, it will vary from culture to culture which values it challenges. But in every culture, sooner or later, it's going to bump against some of the, the driving uh, forces, the, the, the deepest convictions of that culture. And in order to protect itself, the culture will strike out because just like these religious leaders said, we have to stop this thing from spreading. Okay? And so we'll see this as we go through Acts. It's interesting, when we get to Acts 14, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas are out on their first uh, kind of church planting tour. They're sharing the message of Jesus for the first time in southern Turkey. And many people come to Christ, and immediately they begin to be persecuted. And so uh, Paul, as he begins to encourage these believers, here's what he says. They're in your note sheet in chapter 14. He says, Paul was strengthening the disciples, and he was encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Why? Because they're coming into persecution. And he says, here's what he said. Here's how he strengthened. He said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Now, underline that. Underline the word must. Uh, this is not optional equipment on the Christian life. That when you, when you become a Christian, persecution is part of the package. It's not like the rear view uh, the rear view camera in your car when you buy a car. It's not like satellite radio. It's not like the navigation system. Those are options. That this is more like uh, the engine. This is like the transmission. 
This is like the wheels. If you want to follow Jesus, there will be a price to pay. It will vary from time to time, to time culture to culture, but there will be a price to pay. And once you understand this, once you put on these lens of persecution, you put them on, and you read your New Testament, what you'll see is pretty much every book, almost every book of the New Testament, the backdrop is persecution. It's just kind of part of the reality of the early movement of Jesus. One of my favorite passages is in, Acts, is in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, uh, you know, the book of Romans, Paul is laying out this grand scheme, this plan of salvation, where the rebel race but instead of destroying us, God has come after us to rescue us through Christ. And uh, when we come to Jesus, we're not only forgiven, but we receive the power of his spirit to live a whole new life. That takes us up through chapter 8, chapter 1 through 8. And then in the middle of chapter 8, and Paul says, and, and there's more. It's like QVC channel. You know, but, and the, wait, there's more. He said, <laughs> just like Jesus died and rose again, got a new body, he says, uh, the same spirit that lives in us will raise us. One day, he'll give us a new body. We'll get the new version, like 2.0, like Jesus. And, and we are going to rule. This whole world's going to be remodeled. All creation's going to be remodeled. And we're going to rule with Jesus in this new creation. So that's, that's where this story is going. And in the midst of this, this is what he says in chapter 8, verse 17. He says, now, I mean, right now through Jesus, now we are children. We're children of God. You know, we've been born again. Um, and he says, because of that, we are heirs. You know, God's our father. We're heirs of an inheritance, the future. We're heirs of God. We're co-heirs with Christ as our big brother. And then there comes a little word, and I want you to circle it. What's the little word? If. if. And this is the word that runs throughout the New Testament. That if we follow him to the end, we will be saved. That persecution is not like an option, like I'm going to opt out this time. No, this is part of the core equipment. And so he says, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory. And all the way through, all the way through, the, you know, remember the parable of the seeds? And Jesus talked about the, the, the four soils. And he says, uh, only one seed makes it and bears fruit. He says, the second kind of seed, uh, one of the things that causes it to die is persecution. It never bears fruit. It's, it stops, right? So, so all through the New Testament, there's this assumption that if you want to be part of the kingdom, if you want to partake of the glory, if you want to be part of the new creation, if you want the new body, if you want the future, you have to be willing to suffer. It's part of the package. We see it starting here in Acts. We're going to see it all the way through. So if we're going to live life on mission, uh, if we're going to follow Jesus, that we have to get our hands around, this is part of the price that we're called to pay. Now, number two, the second principle that comes out, and it's sort of funny because uh, on Wednesday, my assistant, uh, Vicki, sent over to the uh, other side of campus our printing office, this communications department, and said, here is the, the outline, here's the note sheet for this week. And they sent it back and said, I think you got this wrong. Uh, I think this number two is wrong. I don't think you mean to say this. And so she said, no, that's what he means to say. And, and they came back, I don't think it is. You better check. So she came looking for me. This is what you want to say. And it is what I want to say. It's a little strange. <laughs> number two. Number two goes like this. Disobedience is required. Oh. And you go, wait a second. Like you're always saying obedience is the path to life. Obedient, obedience is, is, is a path to fulfillment. And what are you talking about? What I'm saying is there are times as followers of Jesus when we are required to stand up and to respectfully say no. There are times as followers of Jesus when we have to practice what's often called civil disobedience. We say, in this case, normally I would obey you. Normally I would honor your requests. Normally I'd follow the law. But in this case, I have to obey God, not man. And so what you see in the New Testament is followers of Jesus, we are called to live a life of love. And part of that life of love is being great citizens. Whatever country we're a part of, that we're to honor the, the leaders of our country. Uh, we're to honor the laws of the land. We are to pay our taxes, we're to be good citizens, right? Over and over in the New Testament, it's very clear on this. In fact, 30 years later, after this event where Peter takes a stand, 30 years later, he'll be writing to some Christians in Turkey. And this is what he says to them as a follower of Jesus. He says there in your note sheet, 1 Peter 2, he says, you're to submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, for Jesus' sake, to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king. And remember when he writes this, the emperor in Rome is Nero. 
who burns Christians at his parties for torches. Right? So you say, like, well, I don't know if that really applies to us. Like, look at who we have for this or that. You know, I think we're ahead of the game. So uh, he says, uh, as this, or to the governors, like governors would be like, uh, you know, like Pontius Pilate was a governor, right? Crucified Jesus. Who are sent by, by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. That's the job of government, to commend uh, those who do uh, right, to, to um, hold responsible those who do wrong. And he says, it's, by, it's, it's God's will, this is his will for your life as Christians, that by doing good, catch it, by doing good, as, as followers, followers of you, we're always to do good wherever we go, by doing good, you should silence the talk of ignorant men who would say that Christians are anti-culture or uh, a menace to society. He says, and so he says, here's how you do it. He says, show proper respect to whom? Everyone. Can we circle that? I'm going to come back to the minute, but show proper respect to whom? Everyone. Everyone. Okay. And he says, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, and honor the king, even if the king is Nero, right? Okay, now, uh, so this is a consistent message in the New Testament. As followers of Jesus, we are to be uh, good citizens. We are to be a force for good wherever we go, right? We're to obey our leaders, honor the laws, and so on, right? So it's very consistent. Uh, just a quick sidebar before we go on here. I think, honestly, as followers of Jesus, this is one, one area we need to often reassess. Can I tell you, if, there's a, if I want to get depressed, uh, I know exactly how to do it. <laughs> it's my top way to get depressed. You know, every once in a while you just feel too good about life, you need to bring yourself down. Uh, I go to Facebook. <laughs> okay. And you know why? Because on Facebook... So many of my friends are self-proclaimed Christ followers. And honestly, it's one of the most depressing things that I see. Because you have people who claim to be followers of Jesus. Many of you are on that list, by the way. Just saying. Just, just saying. Just saying. Tell the truth. Speak no lie. Uh, that I see people who are followers of Jesus, I know are followers of Jesus, who are being super full of hatred and attack toward the leaders of our nation or towards the opposite, people who hold opposite side positions on issues. And we are ugly and we're vengeful and we're hatred. We act just like the world. And then we can't understand why the world won't listen to us. I'm telling you, this is crazy. We go on there, we criticize our government, we criticize our president. Catch, catch, wait. Usually, I'm on the same side of the issue. Like, you, I, I would agree. We live in a very dark time. I mentioned last night, I feel like we're in the Shire in Middle Earth, and Mordor is coming. Right? And we're just like happily here in, Mor you know, in, in the Shire, Mordor is coming. And we're often kind of oblivious to that. We live in a dark time. You know, Isaiah, Isaiah says, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. And we live in a day and age where that's happening. It's increasing, right? So I'm with you on this. I see some of the decisions of our government or the, the things of our, our I mean, I'm with you. But Jesus was very clear with us. Here's how you respond to enemies. Here's how you, how you respond to those who hate you. Here's how you respond to those who curse you. You love your enemies. You do good to those who hate you. You bless those who curse you. And then Jesus modeled it on the cross as he's hanging there from injustice, the worst injustice in the history of the world. He says, Father, don't hold this sin against them. Forgive them. And, 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 uh, and, and Jesus pours out his love. See, the message of Jesus is we don't respond with hatred ever. Amen. We respond with love. We respond with courage and truth. We love people. And so Peter says here, hey, even if you're in the Roman Empire, we have the worst empire in the, uh, emperor in the world, 
You still, as followers of Jesus, you do what's right. You do what's good. You take a stand, but you do it with humility. You do it with respect. You do it with respect for all men. You stand for what's right and true and good, but you don't give in to hatred. You don't give in to an attack. You don't give in to the, the, kind of the, the, the weapons of the enemy. You don't return evil for evil, right? So, so, so Peter lays this out there, but having said that, there are times as a follower of Jesus when disobedience is required. And these are not times like, well, I don't agree with the government, so I'm not paying my taxes. <laughs> no, we're talking about that. We're talking about something that's a core moral issue that calls us to violate following Jesus. So throughout the Bible, you have examples, right? Like the Hebrew midwives. Back in Exodus chapter 1, the Pharaoh, king of the land, says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that the nation of Israel is getting too big, too powerful. And so when the baby boys, it's just the opposite of the video today. When baby boys are born, uh, we're going to kill those. I want you to kill the boys, keep the girls alive. That's fine. Kill the boys. And what did they do? They, they completely uh, disobeyed the king. In fact, they made up a lie. They said, you know what? These Hebrew women, they're just in such good shape like marathon riders, they just like pop out those babies so fast we can't even get there. You know, it's like, wow, they just take them away. It's like, and it says, God bless them, right? He said, take their lives. They said, no, we're going to fear God, not man, right? You think of Daniel uh, and his friends in, in, uh, in, in Babylon, you know, almost a thousand years later, the nation of Israel is now in captivity. Daniel and his buddies are all serving the, the kings there. Uh, uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar tells Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, bow down and worship the image, or I'm throwing you into the fiery furnace. They said, hey, we can't. They, by the way, if you read that, they're very respectful. Very respectful. But they said, we can't do that. Um, later on in Daniel's life, the edict comes out. You can only pray to the king the next 30 days. You can't pray to any god. He says, sorry, I can't do that. Very respectful. But I can't do that. Right? So, so there are times... Uh, as followers of Jesus, we have to say no, that we can't, we, we can't do that. We have to disobey, that disobedience is required. Now you say, well, why are you bringing this up now? Because I think we're heading into one of those seasons. Amen. 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 There's a movement of Jesus, as our culture changes, there may become things that are considered illegal that as Christians we cannot participate in, Right? Um, I don't know if you followed this, but earlier this year, this fall, there was a referendum, there was a, a new ordinance passed uh, in Houston, so Houston, Texas of all places, right? Um, and, and so this, this ordinance was called the Equal Access Ordinance, and it was sort of uh, to make sure there was no discrimination against, uh, you know, kind of alternate lifestyles, transgender, and so on. So you, and part of it is, you, can, you know, anyone can use whatever bathrooms, that whole thing. And so this ordinance comes, and so the, uh, there's many people who say, we don't want that law, and so they're going to have a referendum, they're going to grab petitions so that we can get this on the ballot to vote against this thing, right? And so there was, there was some pastors involved in that as well, and so the mayor of Houston, this year, the mayor of Houston and the city council, uh, they uh, issue a subpoena for five, the, for, of these five pastors kind of leading this uh, for their sermons, they're going to have to require by law to turn in all their sermons, any teaching, website stuff, turn it all in to see if there's any hate speech in this. And you're saying, where do we live? When did we move to China? When did Russia come in and take over? I thought this was a U.S. of A. It was built on freedom of religion, which is one of the, the most basic freedoms of all. When that one goes, they all go. Right? I thought this was freedom of speech. Like, what, what's going on? Unfortunately, there was an outcry of some of the religious leaders in our nation, and they later backed down and amended that in, in some way. But it shows you where we're going, right? And here's the thing. As followers of Jesus, we don't change our message to please the authorities, Amen. right? Amen. Like, they don't come and say, like, you can't teach on this. You can't teach on God's vision for sexuality. You can't teach on that anymore. That's hate speech. You can't teach that. If you do, we'll stop you. We'll take away your uh, tax-free status. We'll put you in jail. We'll do, you, you, cannot, you cannot do that. Like, we can't say okay to that. We say, no, we are the light of the world. Like We're the light of the world. If we stop speaking, the world goes dark. 
Like we've got a calling on our life, so do what you may. You know, throw us in the fiery furnace, put us in the lion's den, take our lives, arrest us, but we will not stop speaking the truth about Jesus, you see? And so there comes a time where we will have to say very well in this country, disobedience is required, right? Number three. Number three is that courage is a gift. You know, I think often we look at this and we can get nervous about the future and how will we do and what will it mean for us and our kids in the future, and it's going to be a scary thing. I'd be the first to admit that. But what the Bible promises is in these times of persecution, God meets us, and he will gift us, and he'll empower us. And you know, it's such an amazing thing, um, as you read this account, Um, you'd catch this so much more if you were reading volume one of Luke and volume two of Acts together. If you just sat down in the afternoon, you read them, took a couple hours, just read them. It it would amaze you. It's like, what happened to Peter and John? I mean, just a few chapters ago? I mean, literally, we're in chapter four, right? Go back to four chapters and go one back, go go one back into Luke 24, go five chapters back in this story. And these are the same guys that on when Jesus is arrested and executed that weekend, they are all hiding out with all the disciples in the upper room, uh, afraid for their lives, afraid of the authorities. And you say, which authorities? These authorities. They were afraid of the Sanhedrin because they'd arrested Jesus and executed him. They may be coming after them next. And now we're a couple months later, and these same guys who were hiding from the authorities are standing in front of the authorities and with incredible boldness, not only proclaiming Jesus, but saying, you murdered the Messiah. You made a bad call. There's salvation in no one else. If you want to be saved, you need to come under his leadership. And so what happened? What happened? What happened is that God gifted them. God transformed them. And he gave them a couple gifts. And I want to, I want to highlight I think the first gift was the resurrection of Jesus. And you say, what do you mean? Well, I'm not sure what the apostles believed about the next life before Jesus rose from the dead. I don't really know. Um, What we know is in Israel, which is, you know, very Greco-Roman part of their culture as well as Jewish. What we know is that in Israeli culture at the time, that um, there were many people who believed that at the end of time, when the kingdom of God came, that uh, everyone will be resurrected, the righteous and the unrighteous. They get new bodies. Now, remember, when I say resurrection, I'm not talking about life after death. I'm talking about physical life after death. You get a new body, all right? So many believed in the resurrection of all people, righteous and unrighteous. We know in Israel that many believed only in the resurrection of the righteous, that they would be resurrected and be part of this new creation, that kind of restoration of creation and rule with the Messiah. We know that many in Israel and these religious leaders who arrested Jesus, the high priests, they did not believe in any resurrection. That's why they arrested Jesus. uh, That's why they arrested Peter and John for teaching the resurrection. We saw that earlier in chapter four. And then, of course, they are all greatly influenced by Greco-Roman culture. In the Greco-Roman cult, the Roman Empire, most people believed in life after death, but not physical life after death. They believed you'd go on as a spirit, but not as a okay. So. So we're not really sure like what the apostles all believed. But here's what we do know. That after the resurrection of Jesus, that it completely changed their perspective on the next life. Whatever they thought before was murky, hoped for, maybe, it becomes very real. When you meet with Jesus after he's been executed, he comes back, he's got this new amazing body and you're having dinner with him, and it's personal, and he remembers all the things you used to do, and you can talk about the past, so you can do Bibles. It's like he's Jesus. It's like he's Jesus with just a better body. Right? It's like it's the same guy. And it begins to dawn on you, hey, this life is really not the end. And it begins to dawn on you all that Jesus said about living this life for the next life. Like, he's not kidding. Like, this life is short. It's temporary, it's fallen. The next life is forever, it's real, it's physical, it's tangible. God's gonna restore all of creation. It's gonna be amazing. And once you get clear on that, it like changes your perspective. Like what can man do to you, as Paul will say? What can man do to you? 
Like, well, we can kill you. Well, sure, but I just bounced back. We just saw Jesus. He just bounced back. You killed him. He just came back. He's better than ever. And so this life is short. Next life is long. Amen. And this is a perspective of the whole New Testament. It's not that suffering isn't painful. It's not that suffering isn't hard. It's that it's temporary. And so focus on the big picture here. Like focus on the future, what's, what's coming. And so the first gift they had was a new understanding that this life is not really the end, and therefore they're fearless. It changed their whole perspective. But secondly, the second gift was not just the resurrection, but the power of the resurrection. Amen. You see, the reason that Jesus died and rose was not just so he could be forgiven, but so that the power of the resurrection can be active in our lives. The gift of the Spirit. That we would be empowered to be like Jesus. It's really interesting. In Luke 640, this is not in your note sheet, but in Luke 640, Jesus once said the student, or in the Greek it's disciple, he said the student, the student is not above his master, or like rabbi, teacher. He said, but but when he's fully mature, he'll be like his teacher. Amen. See, the whole point of following Jesus is to become like his Jesus, like Jesus. And what happened here? What happened is that as Peter and John are standing there, the religious leaders are going, oh my gosh, here he comes again. Like we thought we got rid of Jesus. And it's like, you got like Jesus back. These guys are uneducated, like Jesus. They're brilliant, like Jesus. They're smart, like Jesus. They're bold, like Jesus. They're calm, like Jesus. They're incredibly courageous, like Jesus. They speak with authority, like Jesus. They heal people, like Jesus. Crazy, right? And this is why Jesus died. Not just so he could be forgiven, but so he could be empowered to live his life. Amen. And so what you see here is Peter and John are approaching the Sanhedrin just like Jesus did. That they've been empowered by the power of the resurrection. In fact, if you look at your Bibles, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, this was uh, from the passage from last week. Let's start with verse 7. Um, they had Peter and John brought before them, the Sanhedrin. They began to question by what power or what name did you do this? And then catch this. It says, Peter filled with what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Say it again. Filled with what? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. You see, this is what Jesus said. In fact, in volume one of Luke, Jesus predicted all this. He said, if you follow me, you're going to have to pay a price. And look what he says in Luke chapter 21, there in your note sheet, volume one of this story. Jesus says, they're going to lay hands on you. They're going to persecute you. Um, they will deliver you to synagogues, prisons. You'll be brought before kings and governors. He says, and all on account of my name, because of me. And he said, this will result in your being witnesses to them. You're going to have a chance to share the message of Jesus at the highest levels of government. And he says, so make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you'll defend yourselves, for I will give you, catch that, I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Amen. This is exactly what happened here. And it's what we're going to see all the way through Acts. We're going to see it when Stephen stands before the same Sanhedrin. We're going to see it when the Apostle Paul is on trial. What we're going to see is that, is that when Jesus calls us to stand for him, he doesn't call us to stand by ourselves. Amen. He says, I will stand with you, and in that moment, I will fill you with my spirit, and I will empower you to speak the truth in love to a world that desperately needs to hear it. You see? And so, so uh, what I want you to catch is that Often we look at the future and we say, hey, what's going to happen? And we start getting nervous and so on. Let me tell you something. This time that's coming is going to be our finest hour. This time that's coming, he's going to empower us in new ways. We need to get ready for it now. We need to be walking with him now. We need to be in the word now. We need to be listening to his spirit now. We need to be preparing men and women now for the challenge that's coming. Because when it comes, it's too late to get ready. Like we need to be listening now. In the school of Jesus now. And so this leads to a question then. There in your note sheet, I'm going to land the plane here. Life on mission, the question. And, and I'm a very simple question, and it's one you may have thought about, you may not have, but it's just really important, I think, at this time in our history to think about it. And the question goes like this. Are you willing to pay the price? Like in your life right now, are you willing? Uh, in your families, you know, some of you, you're the only believer in your family, and every time you go to Christmas or Thanksgiving, you get mocked, or there's, there's jabs at you. Uh, 
You know, I was talking with a lady who was cutting my hair last month, not the normal lady, but, uh, you know, and she's the only believer in her family. And, and so every holiday, you know, here it comes. Uh, some of you are in very difficult situations at work where people know you're a believer and there's, it's just caused problems for you. Sometimes it's, you know, it can be in your own family. You may be married to someone who's not a believer. It's just, it's just hard. And we've, we've experienced. So the question is, hey, in your career, on your campus, uh, are you willing to pay the price of following Jesus? Uh, and one of the things I'm so thankful for is I'm so thankful for this country. Uh, I'm so thankful I was born in this country. I'm so thankful uh, for the freedoms we have in this country. I'm so thankful I didn't grow up in a persecuted land. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Right? But one of the downsides when you grow up in this country is that often we never ask ourselves this question. Amen. You see, if you come to Christ today in India, if you come to Christ today in Saudi Arabia, if you come to Christ today in Indonesia, if you come to Christ today in parts of Africa, man, you're going to ask this question. Because you know the moment that you're baptized, there's going to be a price on your head. The moment you're baptized, you may be disenfranchised by your family. You may be marginalized by your society. You may lose your job. You may be put out of your village. You may be arrested. You may be beaten. You may be beheaded or executed. And so you, you think about it. Like you, you count the cost. Remember what Jesus said in volume one of Luke, Luke 14, he says, before you go out to build a big building, a tower, before you go to war, he says, you better see if you got enough money to finish the building. You better see if you got enough soldiers in your army. He said, count the cost. And the context was persecution. And so in other countries, when, we come, when someone comes to Christ, I mean, it's just automatic. You're going to count the cost. But in this country, we often don't. We we've haven't asked ourselves that question. And so I think it's really important that we do because we're heading into a time in our country when I truly believe the price of being a follower of Jesus is going up. Amen. And so it's a time we, we need to, to really be asking that question. Um, you know, I, I was reading this fall, um, last January, some of you may have followed this story, but in the city of Atlanta, Right, you know, Atlanta, the South, you think more conservative, right? You think Bible Belt or whatever. City of Atlanta, um, they've got a fire chief there. He's an African American guy. He's was, uh, been in the force 34 years. 2008 becomes the fire, fire chief of Atlanta. He takes a year or so off to go serve with, under President Obama. Uh, he comes back, uh, he's fire chief. And this last year, he was fired. He's fired in January. He's fired by the mayor. And you say, well, why was he fired? Well, because he wrote a book in his own time. Some of his friends at work who knew that he was a Christian asked for a copy. He gave out 20 copies. And in this book, it's a book about following Jesus in a wide variety of areas, but there's a small portion about human sexuality, about why homosexuality is not God's vision, why it's not right. And one of those copies made the way to one of the council members on the city council who is uh, actively living a gay lifestyle. And as a result, the city, the, the mayor fired the fire chief. And what the mayor said in the, in the city council said is that it's fine for you to believe things in your own time. But if you're going to write anything publicly, you have to run it by our ethics committee and get us to sign off on it. You're like, where do we live? What happened to our country? Are you serious? And see, we're heading for a time when religious freedom and the cultural values of our day are coming in clash. Amen. And it'd be really interesting to see how that gets played out. But there, there, there is something at the core here. This is not, uh, not going to go away. And so what's going to happen in our culture is that as followers of Jesus, I believe we're, unless, again, major revival happens, we're going to become increasingly marginalized. We're going to become increasingly demonized for saying things like there is only one way, like we studied last week. There's no other name under heaven, much to say what Peter said, by saying that we think, believe that there is such a thing as right and wrong. And we believe that God has a vision for sexuality. Some things are right, some things are wrong. That those simple statements, I mean, very controversial, and, and there's going to be a price to pay. And increasingly, we will be demonized. Right? Increasingly, we will be seen as narrow-minded. Increasingly, we will be painted as haters. Increasingly, we will be 
uh, painted as bigots. And I understand there are some people with under the br um, large umbrella of Christianity, that would be a great fit. Those ties would be a great fit, right? But, but this is not like most Christians. It's not any Christians I, I, I know. That's not the way it is. It was so crazy to me, this whole, did you see like a Thanksgiving when Starbucks came out with the red cup? And there was this big hubbub in the news about Christians being upset because it wasn't, you know, some Christmas decorations taken off. Like, honestly, I didn't know any Christian was upset about that. Like, what's missing? Snowflakes? Who do we, who, why do we care? It's not like the manger left, right? But the media picks up on that because there seems to be an agenda so many times to paint Christians as ignorant idiots, right? There's an agenda, right? And that will increasingly happen. That will be painted unfairly. It's going to happen. And sometimes we want to wring our hands and throw them up in the air and say, what are we going to do? The media hates us and the world's this and the court's this and what are we going to do? And we start getting all afraid. Can I tell you something? The movement of Jesus was given birth in a climate like that. This is where it grew and thrived. This is where it took over the Roman world. Can I tell you something? In the first 300 church, uh, years of the church, you know what the major criticisms against Christians were? Completely unfair. Number one, they were atheists. You're like, what do you mean they're atheists? Well, they don't believe in the traditional gods of Rome. You say, well, why do you care? Because in the Roman world, they believed the reason Rome was so powerful and blessed was because they'd honored the gods. If anyone didn't honor the gods, that was not just a religious act, that was a political act. It was unpatriotic. You're undercutting the whole basis we've been blessed. So Christians were called atheists. Christians were accused of practicing incest. This was big. You go, why? Well, because they called each other brothers and sisters and they celebrated love feasts. <laughs> like, how unfair is that, right? Christians were accused of being cannibals, big time. Why? Because they celebrate the Lord's Supper and they talk about the body, eating the body and blood of Christ. You go, well, that's not fair. Can I tell you something? Persecution's rarely fair because persecution is not about getting at the truth. Persecution is about protecting a value that you hold dear that the message of Jesus challenges that at all costs must be stopped, just like the religious leaders today. It had nothing to do with the resurrection. Did you notice when they're on trial, there was not one, they arrested them because they were teaching the resurrection. Did you notice when they're on trial, there's not one question about the resurrection. It's never even brought up because it was never about the resurrection. It was about this rising young movement that was a threat to the status quo, that was undercutting their popularity, their power, their prestige, their relationship with Rome that allowed them to rule. It was never about that. And so don't be surprised or frustrated when people come with unfair accusations. Amen. Don't be surprised when Starbucks cups become front page news. <laughs> like, don't be surprised because that's the way persecution works. It's not about fair. It's not about truth. It's about something that is evil being protected that at all costs we will fight over in any way possible. That's what it's about. But here's the good news. These religious leaders tried to shut down Peter and John in the movement of Jesus. Did it work? No. no. In fact, the more they persecuted, the more it grew. Amen. And this is the history of Christianity. More it persecuted, more it grows. And within 30 years, this is one of Luke's agenda to show us how you can do anything to the movement of Jesus. You can shut it up, you can arrest people, you can kill people, but 30 years later, it's gonna be in the capital of the empire in Rome. And guess what? In 300 years, it's gonna take over the Roman Empire. So many people have come to Christ, the political authorities deem it wise and necessary to proclaim it as the empire's religion. Right? And so here's the thing. Jesus said... I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. But they will try. And the early church won because they refused to stop speaking the truth. They loved people. They loved God. They had the message of life. 
They realized what was at stake. And so they refused to stop speaking. They were willing to suffer for the message. And they kept their eyes focused on the future and the next life that's coming. And that's exactly how we're going to win. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. God, we're just uh, thankful to be living in this time. It's an amazing time. It's an amazing time. I believe technology, we can just share the message of Jesus worldwide in an instant. God, it's an amazing time in our culture, a time at critical crossroads. And we pray for our nation. God, we pray that you would protect us. We pray you protect these uh, religious freedoms and so on. We pray for these court cases that are even currently going on right now. But God, more than that, we pray for boldness. We pray for courage. We pray that we would not back down. We pray that we would not fail you in this critical hour. We pray the message of Jesus would go forth, the message of love, that we would love our enemies, that we would do good to those who hate us, that we would share hope in a world that's desperately needing. We'd share about a God who loves us, who's rescued us, who's come after us in Christ, who wants to restore us, a new world that's coming, and what it takes to be part of that. God, we pray as we move out into uncharted waters, as you call us out on the ocean with you in this new era, amid perhaps increasing persecution, we pray you'd meet us there. And we pray, God, as, as Steve said in this video, we pray that we would be a light to the world, that, that fire would keep on burning, that for, for your sake, for your fame, for your name, for your kingdom, for your will, and for the people who desperately need to hear this message, we would not be silent. Amen. And we pray as we bring your offerings and our gifts, whether it's our regular tithes or over and above for this amazing ministry of the Himalayan Joy Home, we pray that you would bless it, put your hands in this, multiply it for the sake of your name and your fame. Amen. Let's stand and worship.